And so anyway, the different things and the relics and so forth that were there needed to be saved. And so some people ran in and, and tried to get those things. And one of the things that they saved, that they brought out and, and um, was this crown of thorns. And it was supposed to be the original crown of thorns that, that Jesus wore. Now, I don't know about you, but the skeptical part of me goes, yeah, well, how'd they know that? <laughs> how do they know this is a really the crown of thorns? Meaning it was supposed to be that. You know, down through the years, people have focused on different symbols and different things. There was a period of time in church history where the, the wealthy people focused on all the relics of Christianity that they could gather together and, and show and brag about how many relics they had. And, but there's always been these always different images that we've had, these symbols of Christianity. And actually, the cross itself was not a symbol of Christianity for nearly 400 years, not a main symbol of Christianity, for about 400 years after, after Jesus died. And part of the reason was that the, the idea of a, of a cross, a place of crucifixion, was, was very offensive to people. As I've said before, it'd be kind of like us having a hangman's noose hanging from the ceiling. You go, oh, what is that? Oh, that's the sign of my Savior. What? You know, people thought, you know, a, a symbol of execution was an odd thing. And so it took a number of years before that really became the primary symbol. The probably first symbol of Christianity was the fish. You've probably heard that story. The fish. The Greek word for fish is ichthus. And each of the letters of the, of the Greek word ichthus represent Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. And so the fish was probably the first symbol of Christianity. Later on, some other things came in that they had an anchor. Somebody used an anchor. It had the cross beam of the anchor, but the ends turned up, so that was the cross and the resurrection. And that was a symbol for a while. When Constantine became ruler of, of, uh, of Rome and made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, he changed the symbol to be uh, the chi rho, which is the Greek letter chi, which it looks like an X. It has a CH sound. And rho looks like a P, but it has an R sound. It's the first three letters of Christ. And he made this symbol, the Cairo, put it on the shields of, their, of the soldiers, and that's how they went into battle. And it wasn't years later till the cross actually became a primary symbol. And now today, it, it tends to be our primary symbol of Christianity is the cross. And we look at the cross and we say, this is where Jesus died, where he suffered for us, where he paid the penalty for our sins. But you know, always think about the symbols of Christianity and, and it's only this time of the year for some reason that the empty tomb becomes a symbol. I wonder why it's not the symbol all the time. Because you see, as I've said before, without the resurrection, the cross has no meaning. We sing songs about the power of the cross, but there's no power in a cross, especially if there's no resurrection. And I think the empty tomb is a, our primary symbol of Christianity. And yet, as I said before, I guess it's hard to kind of put little tombs on the top of your church and in your windows and make little, little, make little pieces of gold jewelry out of it. It just doesn't make a nice little piece of jewelry. And, but, but it is the primary symbol. It's the, it's the empty tomb because if the tomb wasn't empty, if there was no resurrection, we have no faith. And Paul makes that clear in 1 Corinthians 15. There was a few of Jesus' disciples that after Jesus rose from the dead, they were skeptical. They weren't so sure that this was true. They had the story of the empty tomb, but this like, well, what does this really mean? We're going to look at a few of those disciples today. It's found in Luke chapter 24. We're going to follow this, this little story, which is not just a story, this event that happened of some of the disciples after Jesus had died. He rose again. The disciples found the empty tomb. People were claiming he was alive. And there's two disciples, not of, not of the, not of the original twelve, but two other disciples are making their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus. You've probably heard the story of the Emmaus Road. And we're going to look at this story a little bit and draw some truths and application from it. So I'm in Luke 24, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were, were going to the, to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. We're talking about Jesus' death and his resurrection or the empty tomb. And as they walked together and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. So now they're, they're just walking down this road, and this, as far as they know, it's a stranger comes up and just starts walking with them. Okay, cool, you know, if you want to walk with us, fine. We're, gonna, we're walking to Emmaus. And he asked him, 
What are you discussing together as you walk together? Walk along. And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and you do not know the things that have happened there in these days? You mean you hadn't heard about this? Man, this was, this was Jerusalem wide. There was all this stuff going on and, and in the midst of the Passover, they were bringing this guy Jesus and they, you know, they, they brought him before the people and everybody screamed for his crucifixion and they crucified him. I mean, you, you hadn't heard about all this? Where were you, buddy? Asleep? Jesus says, what thing? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was, he was a prophet, powerful of word and deed before God and all the people. Notice he was a prophet. He didn't call him Messiah or Savior. He was, he was a prophet. And the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to, the, to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. Notice this next statement. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Past tense. There's no more hope here. Early it says they were downcast. They were discouraged. They were distraught. And now they said we had hoped that he was the one. But obviously he's dead, so he can't be the one. And he died. We saw him. He was crucified. And, and see, hope is lost at this point. Hope is lost because the the... The one who was supposed to redeem Israel is no longer with them. And they go on to say, and what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman said, but him they did not see. <laughs> hear the skepticism here? Okay, you know, they saw this tomb and this tomb is empty, but we didn't see him. No one saw him. You know, poor Thomas gets a bad rap. You know, Thomas, doubting Thomas, you've heard it. You know, Thomas, you know, he says, unless I see him and put my fingers in his hands and in his side, I will not believe. Well, these guys are the same way. Yeah, the tomb was empty, but nobody saw him. They're skeptical too. They just can't. I mean, the concept of the resurrection was just so far beyond their thinking that they just couldn't believe this was true. Jesus even said several times, he told his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And after three days, I'm going to rise again. Three days later, they rose again. They're going, but nobody saw him. Nobody saw him. He was skeptical. You know, I can be skeptical sometimes. I can imagine myself being there. Going, yeah, okay, right, right. Where is he? Show him to me. Where is this Jesus? I mean, we got to have proof, right? That's what he means he ever saw. It's okay to be skeptical sometimes. But Jesus had promised this was going to happen. The resurrection. And so these people, these, these disciples had lost hope. This just can't be. We had hoped. But you know, understanding the resurrection, I can compare these disciples with those who believe that he was alive, comparing, um, we can compare Nebraska football fans to Mississippi State football fans. See, Nebraska football fans, You've experienced the joys of a national championship. Five times, right? Is that right? Right? Five times. National champions, five times. And see, you can taste that victory again. You, you know that it's possible because it's happened in the past and you just, you just wait every year. Every year it's going to get better. You just know and, and, you know, you get a new coach and he's going to be the one. This new coach is our new football messiah. And you're just hoping he's going to resurrect to the national championship again. And you're just waiting because you can taste it. You have this hope that it can happen. Be glad you're not a Mississippi State fan. We've never won a national championship in anything. And so 
th- th- this is our slogan. You know, when we start doing really well, this, this is how negative we are. Our slogan is, what goes up must come down. <laughs> it, it just doesn't happen. We learn not to get our hopes up because we don't think it's really going to happen. Well, you see, these guys had lost their hope. They just didn't think this was supposed to be Messiah, the one to redeem Israel, the one to bring the answers, the one to restore the nation to its former glory. He was the Savior. He was the one. And he's dead. And they had lost all hope. As they continue on, though, Jesus speaks to them. Verse 25, he says, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Here's this stranger coming up and say, you hadn't listened to the prophets? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You see, Jesus is not just found in the New Testament. (laughs) He's found in the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. All the prophets, all the Old Testament, they all made reference to him. They all spoke of him. Maybe not as clearly as we see it now, but there was references all throughout the Old Testament of this Jesus, this Messiah, this one who would come. And Jesus began to explain these things to him and teach them the truths of the Old Testament. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost here. So he went in to stay with him. This guy was, this guy whom they assumed was a stranger is teaching them truth. They're listening to his words. He's explaining the prophets and all the scriptures and, and they're beginning maybe to gain a little bit of hope again. Yeah, yeah, the scriptures did say these things. Stay with us, teach us some more. And so there's this, this, this returning of hope just a little bit to, in their, in their lives. And, and so Jesus stays with them and then he says, when, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give, give it to them. Okay, so they've had this meal. He takes a loaf of bread and he breaks it, blesses it, and he hands it to them. And now something suddenly happens. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. It's Jesus. He's the one. He's there. They saw him. The proof is there. These Poor skeptical disciples now got to see Jesus face to face. They recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Oh, stay with us, Jesus. (laughs) Here in his resurrected body, he appeared to them. He was able to hide himself for a period of time or or disguise himself so that they didn't understand who he was. But when they saw him, then he disappears. And notice what they say here. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? <laughs> Why didn't we recognize him? We felt it down deep in our soul. We felt down deep in our hearts as he proclaimed the truth. Something was different. Something was good. We were feeling it. Why didn't we recognize him before that? He was speaking truth into our heart, into our lives. The passion was beginning to return. And it returned once they saw who he was. You know, the resurrection was one of these things that, that people have tried to discredit over the years. Uh, there was a, a teacher in a, in a school was trying to, Bible college, he was trying to teach his students the emphasis of the resurrection and how important it was. And so he brought in this, this jar of marbles and he set it down. And he had everybody in the room guess how many marbles was in the jar. And he had all these different numbers, 300, 400, whatever. And then he said, now, in a few minutes, we're going to pour it out and we can count them and we, you can factually know how many marbles is in this jar. And then he passed, then he passed out a bunch of Starburst candy and everybody got a different flavor of candy. He says, now, which is the correct candy? And they begin to talk and they said, well, it's, you know, it's, which is correct. I mean, it's, it's a matter of opinion. Which, which one you like the best? It's your opinion. So then he asked him, he said, now when it comes to religion, do most people focus on their opinions or do they focus on facts? And the conclusion was that the majority of people are focusing on opinions. And he said, 
listen, to, he began to talk about the resurrection. He said, look, either the resurrection is true or it's not. There's no opinion. You can't say the resurrection is true for me, but it may not be for you. It's either a fact or it's not. There's no, there's no opinion about it. Okay? You can't just say, well, ah, he resurrected too true for me. No, that, that's, that's not a choice. That's not an opinion. It's either true or it isn't. And you see, down through history, we have the, the, the recorded history of what happened that Jesus rose from the dead. The grave was empty. He is alive. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared to many other people. And the proof is there. It's not just an opinion. It's one of the best documented facts in all of ancient history. Jesus was alive. And so because of this, because we can have certainty in, in the resurrection of Jesus, this leads us into several different assurances. I want to share with you at least five different assurances that we have because of Jesus' resurrection. You see, the word hope in the Bible more often means an assurance. An assurance. It wasn't just, you know, we hope it doesn't rain this afternoon, or we hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, we hope it doesn't snow anymore. That's what I hope. But I don't know. It might snow this next week. Who knows? That's the type of way we use the word hope. But hope is more often an assurance. And so because Jesus is alive, we have these hopes, these assurances in Christ. Number one, we have the assurance of Jesus' identity. Who He is. Not just who He was, but who He is. You see, Jesus said... I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. If he didn't do that, then you can't really trust his words. But because he rose again, he's the only person who rose again never to die again, we can trust what he has to say. We can trust who he is. He is the one and only Son of God. A member of the Godhead and a member of the Trinity itself. He is God who came in the flesh. He is the creator of the universe who existed before time. Scriptures are clear. He is the creator. He is the king who is above all kings. And he is the king who is above all lords. He is the only one and true king. He said, I am the bread of life. If you want to, if you want to live, if you want to have real life, you need to come to me because I can give you life, real life. Eternal life. I am the light of the world. Jesus came to bring the light of the truth of God to mankind. He is the good shepherd who is the door and the protector of his sheep. One in whom we can trust to watch over us and care for us. He is the only Savior of mankind. You know, today, the news bothers me a lot. I don't listen to it as much as maybe I ought to, but, you know, I hear all this stuff and, and right now there, there's all this attack upon different people's characters. Especially, especially the president. Now I'm, I know the president's not a perfect man, okay? And, and so there's all these attacks upon him and his character, what he's like and what he believes and all this different stuff. And, and you can hear all these one things and, and those who like him are defending him. Those who don't like him are constantly attacking him. And it's like, who is, who is this man? How, what of this can we believe is true? The same happened with, with President Obama. You know, those who liked him were always defending him and, and saying how great he was, and those who didn't like him were always looking for something to criticize. And so that's the way it is in the world. And it's, it's like, who really knows these people? How do, what are they really like? Because you have the public face, and then you have another face. That's true of all the presidents, not just these two I've used an example of. What, what are they really like? What is their character? Jesus has revealed Himself to us. He has let us see who He is, what He, what He said, what He's like. He's revealed Himself to us. He hasn't hidden anything. And His resurrection helps us to see and know who He truly is. And we have this assurance. You don't need, 
you know, the news media to tell you who Jesus is. He's revealed Himself through His Word and through His Spirit. And we can have confidence in that because Jesus is alive. He is our living hope. We also can have the assurance of His Word. You know, you have your Bible here and some of, some of you have a red letter version. I have a red letter version. It has all the words of Jesus in red. Well, did you know that really all this is His Word? It's okay to have the words of Jesus in red. That's okay. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that it's all His Word. He was the creator of all things, and therefore, when this was laid down, He was in charge of having it written for us. You can have confidence in this Word because Jesus is alive. This is just a book. It's a living book. It's the living words of a living Savior. And you can have confidence in this Word and what it has to say. It's kind of like if you had a friend who went down to a Nebraska football. You had four friends who went to a Nebraska football game. And you didn't get to see it. You didn't get to watch it on the TV or on the radio. And they came back and they described the game to you. And one person was, no, no, assuming they won, okay. One person was, uh, was telling about how great the offense was. And all the plays they ran. And another person was talking about the defense. And the next person you talked to said, man, those coaches, boy, they just had such good decisions. They called such great plays. And the fourth person was said, man, you should have been in the stadium. It was great. It was awesome. Especially on that, you know, winning touchdown. And so they have a different perspective of the game, but they're all describing the same game. And when they all describe the winning touchdown, each one has a little different perspective on it, and they tell a little different detail, but it's all the same play. It's all the same game. You see, that's what we have in the four Gospels. <laughs> we have four accounts of the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus told by four different people, but they're telling a little bit different perspective. There's some overlap and similarity, but there's some differences. But it doesn't make it wrong. It doesn't mean they're contradicting. They're all looking at the same game. They're all telling the same story, a true story. The life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. It's true. This message is true. And we can count on it. Because Jesus is alive. We can know that the gospel is true. We can have confidence when Jesus said, for <laughs> God so loved the world. You know the verse. You can say it backwards, probably. That He gave His one and only Son. He's talking about Himself there. The Son of God. He gave Him. What did He give Him for? He gave Him to come into the world to bear the burden for sin for you and for me. He gave His Son for us. He gave His one and only Son. That He would die. He would, he would be buried. He would rise again the third day. That whoever believes, the word believe means faith, to trust. Whoever places his or her faith or trust in this person, in this Son, in this Jesus Christ, will receive the gift of everlasting life. That's the gospel. Summarized in a verse. And Jesus went on to say this. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. See, we, we, we didn't need someone to come and condemn us because we did a pretty good job of that ourselves. <laughs> he didn't come to bring condemnation. <laughs> he didn't send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, that means all people, might be saved through Him. The Gospel is available to all people. For all time, it's available to receive by grace through faith. This is the gospel message. And it's true because Jesus is alive. If he's, if he's dead, let's throw it out and go do something else. But he's alive. He's a living Savior. Because we have a living Savior, we can have confidence in the gospel. You don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. You don't have to shy away from it. You're going to have confidence. The gospel is true. And God is still saving people by grace through faith through Jesus Christ. You know, today, this, it's just hard to know what's true anymore, isn't it? I mean, it, it's hard to even know what's a really an a, a, a attempt to be an accurate news channel and what it tends to be fake news. I mean, you, some of these sites out there will say, yeah, this is, this is satire. This is not really true. 
People take that stuff and post it all over the internet. Oh, look at this, look at this. And it was even, they even say it's fake news, but what's the truth anymore? It seems as if we can't know. One thing is true. Jesus is still saving people by grace through faith in Him. And you can take that to the bank. The gospel is true. But not only that, we can have the assurance of our relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, for most of us, our our relationship is 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 a physical a, 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 one that we can see, that we can touch, we can talk to people. There's a you know, you can put your arm around your loved one or give them a hug, and, and there, there's this there's this presence you can have with a person. That's the way our closest relationships are. They're not just through the internet. A real relationship. You know, has this, this personal connection. And so it's hard for some of us to have a personal connection with a God you can't see. But you see, we're not just physical beings. We're spiritual beings. And the relationship we have with Christ is not just a physical, it, it's a spiritual relationship that goes down deep within our soul because He lives within us. And so we can have assurance of this relationship because He's alive. Even if you don't feel like it sometimes, even if sometimes if you feel like God is far away, He's not. Because the resurrected King, the resurrected Savior said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never leave you or forsake you. And we have the assurance of this relationship. If there's something prob a problem in the relationship, guess whose fault it is? Yeah, not His. But finally, we can have the absolute assurance of everlasting life. Life that lasts forever. That's our greatest hope. Because it, this, I said before, this body, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to die someday. You know, maybe you'll live to a nice old age and live a long time or, Maybe you'll be killed on the highway on the way home. Maybe you'll get some sort of disease. I don't know. I don't know how much longer any of us have to live. These bodies will die. But we have the promise and the hope of everlasting life. The promise of the resurrection to know we will be raised to new life, a new eternal body, an everlasting body that will be with Him forever. This is what the resurrection promises us. We can take that to the bank too. <laughs> we have the promise of everlasting life. Did you know in the last 100 years, advances in medicine have been adding two years to the average life expectancy uh, for every decade? We keep adding time that people can live longer because of medical advances. But there's some people that decide that this is not enough. And they're doing research now to figure out how to extend life even longer. Here's some examples. Oracle co-founder Larry Ellison has spent $430 million on anti-aging research and spent $200 million on his cancer institute at the University of Southern California. Anti-aging. How can we stop this aging process? He has often been quoted as saying, death never made any sense to me. Well, it's not necessarily a happy thing. In 2014, Google founders, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, announced $1.5 billion research center, $1.5 billion research center, they launched Calico, a life, extend, life extension company focusing on genetic research and the development of pharmaceuticals targeting disease associated with old age. One and a half billion dollars to try to find the fountain of youth so you won't get old. And I know some of you young people are hoping they find that. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but I mean, you know, we, we want to stay forever young. In 2016, Amazon founder John, uh, Jeff Bezos um, and other investors gave one $116 million to the, to the Unity Biotechnology, whose aim was targeting cellular mechanisms at the root of age-related 
diseases. Entrepreneur Dave Osprey, the creator of the Bulletproof Coffee, takes about 150 supplements a day to delay cognitive decline. He believes he'll live to be 180. His various pioneer treatments on himself have cost at least $1 million because we want to live forever. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> Maybe they'll figure out how to live to 200 years. Sooner or later, this body just gives out. It ain't going to happen. But in Jesus Christ, we have the promise of everlasting life. And we can have assurance of that because He is alive. We have a living Savior. And because we have a living Savior today, you can be assured of these things. The identity of Jesus Christ, we know who He is. No question. He is who He said He, he is. You can have confidence in the Word of God. You can have assurance that this is true. No matter what people say about it, no matter how people attack it, this is the message, this is the Word of Christ, it's true. You can have assurance in the Gospel. It is the Gospel for the salvation of mankind. It is the good news that men can be saved and women can be saved and children can be saved forever by the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have the confidence in your relationship with Him. He is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And you can have the absolute assurance of eternal life. All because we have a living Savior. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we know that you are alive. We can have absolute confidence in that. And not... You know, not have some religion based upon a, a dead leader, a dead savior, a, a, the questions about what's going to happen to us. You have made it clear. You have re revealed it to us. And if we would just place our hope and faith and trust in that, we can have these assurances. We can live with a confidence. We can live in confidence of the gospel, knowing that, that you will redeem and save people through this gospel for all who believe. In the Lord Jesus Christ and place their faith and trust in Him. Thank you for that. Let us walk this week in absolute confidence and assurance, not of ourselves, but of you. Not of pride and arrogance of who we are, but of thankfulness and glory because of who you are and what you did for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you are alive. We love you. Thank you that we serve a living Savior. Amen. Amen.